Good day, everyone, and uh, welcome to this virtual session um, on the path to sustainable cold change for all um, in Africa, uh, which is being hosted by UNAP by the UNAP-led Cool Coalition and the UNAP uh, United for Efficiency at the Africa Climate Week 2021. Um, today's discussion on scaling up sustainable cold chains in Africa um, addresses a key issue um, that intersects across a number of SDGs, uh, whether they are related to agriculture, food security, healthcare, poverty, socioeconomic growth and development, climate resilience, um, and adaptation. Um, it is also timely, I don't know whether by design or not, uh, that this session is taking place on the International Day of Awareness of Food Loss and Waste. Um, given the central role that cold chains play in tackling food loss um, at various stages of the agriculture sector and have an impact on um, improving incomes and market access for farmers. Um, today, we, will, uh, we have a lineup of an exceptional set of speakers and panelists, um, and we will um, hear about the central role that cold chains play um, in the development of the agriculture sector and other sectors. Um, and also about the gap that exists in the infrastructure for cold storage across the African continent. Um, we also have a great panel uh, to help us unpack the opportunity, the solutions, the challenges uh, based on their diverse experience. Uh, so uh, without further ado, um, allow me to call on uh, Mr. Brian Dean, who is the head of energy efficiency and cooling at the Sustainable Energy for All. Uh, for his special remarks. Um, and Brian, uh, would also appreciate if you would uh, spend a few minutes um, sort of introducing yourself um, as well for your remarks. Over to you. Okay, great. Thank you, Divyam. And uh, hello, everyone. Um, yeah, at, at SC for All, we uh, run the Cooling for All program and uh, certainly are looking to make sure that access to cooling uh, is, is an opportunity for everyone in the world. And you know, first I'd like to thank the organizers and the Cool Coalition and also underline how important it is that sustainable cold chains are on the agenda for Africa Climate Week. And as Divya mentioned with today being the International Day of Awareness on food loss and waste, it's a good time to reflect on why we should be trading, treating sustainable agricultural cold chains as an urgent development issue. The global figures are of course astounding with almost half a billion tons or 13% of food production lost due to a lack of cold chain. But those who are at risk, you know, this isn't abstract. Without cooling, they're unlikely to be able to store nutritious food, grow farming businesses, find protection in a heat wave, or possibly receive a COVID-19 vaccination. And in Sub-Saharan Africa, where energy access gaps persist, and agricultural agriculture drives uh, economies, the risks are particularly acute. Uh, as underlined in SE for All's latest chilling prospects report today, over a billion people still face immediate risks because, because of lack of access to cooling. This means one in every eight people are at risk from rising temperatures, broken cold chains that prevent them from receiving a safe vaccine or eating nutritious food. In Sub-Saharan Africa, this includes 174 million among the rural poor and 215 million among the urban poor in 31 high impact countries for cooling. Numbers that only grew from 2020 to 2021 because of the COVID-19 pan pandemic, forcing millions more into poverty. So action on sustainable cooling and agricultural cold chains is needed now more than ever to ensure that our food and energy systems support the development, the sustainable development goals and the pandemic recovery. So on that note, I do wanna congratulate the Cool Coalition for their contributions to the UN Food Systems Summit, including the new brief that Toby uh, will tell us more about on the status of global food cold chain, which lays out key recommendations that are holistic and needs driven, uh, including credible long-term cold chain plans bolstered by skills development and data. Um, here at SC for All, we support those types of approaches and are working with the Cool Coalition partners to ensure needs-driven approaches are reflected in national cooling action plans. 
I also want to take this opportunity to thank the Cool Coalition for submitting an ambitious energy compact that was profiled at the UN High Level Dialogue during the UN General Assembly Week. Um, and that includes targets for supporting India and Rwanda on integrated sustainable coal chains. So with the High Level Dialogue on Energy and the UN Food Systems Summit behind us, it's time for us to redouble our efforts. Uh, MOP 33 and COP 26 ahead of us, they're important, uh, it's an important window for us to keep up the momentum on delivering new sustainable cooling commitments. The urgency to get political commitment is real. We only have nine years left to achieve the sustainable development goals, and that can't be done without sustainable cold chains in a world where over 750 million lack access to electricity, most of them in Sub-Saharan Africa. Household refrigeration has to be made a reality. In a world where over 800 million are malnourished, cooling can help farmers grow their businesses and feed the planet. In a warming world, for over 3 billion people who face some type of cooling access risk, they need sustainable solutions to protect them and the planet from rising temperatures. At sd for all we are pleased to work with the Cool Coalition partners to accelerate this transition. Um, and thank you, and back over to you, Divyan. Thanks so much, uh, Brian. Um, and definitely, I think key you know, points about the links to SDGs, the need for urgent action, um, as well as sort of um, using, you know, existing the compacts, the HLDE and the momentum generated through the climate processes to uh, bring investments into sustainable coal chain. Um, now, handing over the floor to Toby Peter, Professor for Cold Economy at the University of Birmingham, um, who will present some key findings from uh, the status of global cold chain um, report. Over to you, Toby. Thank you, and uh, thank you for inviting me here today. Um, we know the numbers. Let's just be clear. Food saved is as important as food produced. But are we asking, I think, the right exam question? Yes, we have to create the local and global field to fork system to nutritionally feed nine or 10 billion people by 2050. But at the same time, we've got to support the hundreds of millions of small scale farmers whose livelihoods and well being are often dependent on only one or two hectares of land. And as important, we've got to do this sustainably with the limits of our planet. Let's not forget that conventional cold chains are energy intensive and they use ozone depleting and climate warming refrigerants. So, as you've heard with the Cool Coalition and Climate and Clean Air Coalition and the UNFAO and UNEF and others, um, and with the support of the Italian government, we're producing a status report to help better identify and accelerate solutions to simultaneously feed the world, support smallholder farmers, and protect our environment. It will show the current state and development across such areas as technology, design approaches, capacity building, finance, and business model, policy and planning. It's gonna be published in December. And as you heard, a short summary was, was published last week, and I really do urge it's worth a read about the strategies for delivering sustainable cold chain. A couple of key high level points I want to raise. Current cold chain interventions focus on low risk siloed approaches aiming to solve issues in isolation. However, the food cold chain is a complex system with many static and moving elements from farm, post harvest management and packing, sorting and grading right the way through to the point of sale and indeed consumption. As such, establishing a robust and sustainable cold chain requires the continuing integrated and seamless management of all these elements, protecting against environmental or social impact or unintended consequences. And it requires accountability for multiple levels, levels farmers, processors, manufacturers, aggregators, distributors, retailers, and the consumers. So in short, we have to recognize that developing a sustainable food cold chain is really a wicked problem. It's got diverse partners, drivers, barriers, and they're all interconnected, varying across countries, and depending on the local economic, environmental, social, cultural, and political circumstances. So it's much more than simply installing a solar cold room at the farm gate or chiller cabinets with lower GWP refrigerants in the supermarket. 
And the way to support a sustainable code chain is through co coordination. Where we tackle smaller or siloed issues, we have to do that within the system and through collaborative efforts with others to ensure that each element of the farm to fork chain is addressed. Equally, to deliver sustainable solutions, we have to recognize that we've got to build the skills and capacity required to ensure proper installation and servicing of next generation equipment with lower or negligible GWP refrigerants, whilst at the same time delivering the short-term intervention to reduce cooling loads energy requirements today. As one example, I'm sure you'll hear more about this today, we've launched last year the Africa Centre of Excellence for Sustainable Cooling and Cold Chain, led by the governments of the UK and Rwanda, UNEP, United for Efficiency, University of Rwanda and TEMA here in the UK. And here, alongside de demonstrating and proving refrigeration and cold chain technology in market, we want to help build in-country after-sales capacity, develop the techno-economic business models and financing mechanisms, help shape policy, and develop the capacity through research, teaching, and training programs. In so doing, we believe that ACES can help develop and accelerate the uptake of sustainable cold chain solutions, as I said, not just for nutrition, but to also economically empower farmers, increase export revenues, enhance job creations in rural areas, reduce climate environmental impacts, and foster low carbon development. All the elements we need to address in this system approach. And this center is going to serve as a hub across Africa and the first living lab as a, as a point of, of, of cascading knowledge out is being already set up and designed in Kenya. So thank you very much. Please think about the system and think about the need for skills and capacity. Thank you. Thank you so much, Toby, for, for really emphasizing the, the need for a holistic approach. And I think a key point there is that it goes well beyond the technology solution itself. Um, it's, it's more about how you integrate it within a broader system, uh, bring in the skills, the financing, the policy, and how all of that fits in together um, through partnerships and coordination. So thanks so much for setting the scene um, on, on, that, on that way of thinking. Um, so we'll now uh, transition to our panel discussion. I'm very delighted to have uh, a very distinguished, very experienced panel uh, that bring diverse perspectives. Uh, what we do is uh, perhaps briefly, uh, you know, go through the panelists one by one, and I'd request them to, um, you know, briefly introduce themselves um, and also tell us about uh, the work that they're doing in terms of supporting the goals of delivering sustainable cold chain solutions. Um, and I think that would give the audience a, a good um, idea of where uh, everyone is coming from. Uh, so perhaps um, uh, we would uh, begin with uh, Professor Noza, uh, who's the Deputy Vice Chancellor of University of Rwanda. So over to you. Well. Thank you so much, Devian. And uh, let me uh, quickly thank the organizers and the Cool Coalition for inviting me to be a part of this. Uh, this is what I uh, regard as extremely timely. I think Devian mentioned it earlier on. This is a time, timely panel discussion on the part of sustainable cold chains for all in Africa. Uh, my name is Nosa Igibo, and I'm a professor of chemical engineering, actually. I also happen to uh, have the privilege, as mentioned by Divian, uh, of serving currently as the Deputy Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs and Research at the University of Rwanda. As mentioned earlier by Toby, uh, I know a good number of us, maybe not all of us, uh, aware of the fact that the uh, Africa Center of Excellence for Sustainable Cooling and Coaching, the uh, ACES as our acronym, is hosted right here at the University of Rwanda on behalf of uh, the government of Rwanda and other partners, including the government of the uh, United Kingdom. So in my role as uh, DVC to define how I support the, the work, you know, and the goals of delivering sustainable coaching solutions, I uh, do provide uh, administrative oversight for the center 
in terms of the development and implementation of all of his program uh, for, for, you know, not only Rwanda and the region, basically with uh, hope of expanding activities throughout the continent of Africa by building a number of halls. I am also an engineer, like I mentioned, a chemical engineer, and therefore I strongly, in terms of my professional interest, I have a pretty strong interest in contributing to the actual development of cold chain technology and the deployment design of these technologies, you know, just to, to uh, solve the kind of problems that has been uh, clearly articulated by Brian and Toby at the beginning of this discussion. So my work fully supports the goals of delivering sustainable cold chain solutions, uh, you know, throughout Africa. I'll stop there for the introduction. Yeah, thank you, David. Thanks. Thanks so much, Professor. Uh, we'll move to uh, Gareth Phillips, who is the Manager for Climate and Environment Finance at the African Development Bank. Uh, over to you, Gareth. Uh, yes, um, good afternoon. Uh, and uh, thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me to be present. Um, so, uh, ladies and gentlemen, indeed, uh, I'm the Manager of Climate and Environmental Finance, the African Development Bank, which means that we access funds from the GEF, the, uh, the Global Environment Facility, the Climate Investment Funds, the Green Climate Fund, and we manage a couple of internal trust funds uh, that are focused on uh, climate change, uh, adaptation mitigation, uh, gender and climate and so on. So um, uh, I think uh, it's uh, uh, within those activities, uh, it's important to note that we are working to mobilize uh, some funds from the Green Climate Fund uh, for a private sector investment into cold chain in East Africa. Uh, so that's an example of a private sector project. And um, more broadly on, uh, on public sector work, we are looking at energy performance standards, not so much in cold chain at the moment, but particularly in air conditioning uh, for uh, accommodation and um, uh, industrial purposes and so on. Um, so, so these are some areas where uh, we are engaging on a day-to-day -day basis in cold chain. Back to you, Divyan. Thank you. Thanks so much, Gareth. Um, our next panelist is, um, is Leke, uh, from, uh, who's looking after business development for global food and agri networks at Rabobank. Over to you, Leke. Yes, thank you. Um, okay, let me start with uh, uh, telling you all what uh, uh, Rabobank is. Uh, we are a private sector bank in the uh, space of food and agri. Um, uh, we uh, exist for about 120 years already, uh, founded by farmers in the, in the Netherlands, uh, but now uh, working uh, on a global level. Uh, our mission is growing a better world together, and therefore we have a banking for food strategy uh, based on four uh, major transitions. The first one is uh, a, a lower greenhouse gas economy. The second one would be biodiversity. Uh, the fourth would be food loss and waste reduction. And the uh, fourth would be uh, digitization. Uh, so this is a bit of a background of Rabobank and what we do. We are involved in an initiative, uh, uh, what is still in the making, it's not there yet, but uh, together with FAO and World Bank, we are looking at the Cool Move, which is an, an initiative in which we want to accelerate cold chain uh, in emerging markets. Um, and uh, what we see there in that initiative uh, are a few challenges. Uh, the first one, of course, is if you want to uh, accelerate uh, cold chain in emerging markets, your main target audience would be smallholder farmers. Um, and this is one of the challenges for uh, private sector banks because smallholder farmers uh, are very difficult to finance. Uh, because normally their their position is quite weak. They have low capital. The size and scale of their operations is 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 most of the time quite small. They have liquidity issues, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, smallholder finance is is uh, regularly a, a big challenge for private sector banks. The second challenge we see is that there is a lack um, of viable sorry. business models. 
apologies to interrupt um we'll, we'll get into the sort of uh, the challenges and the needs in follow-up rounds uh we just wanted to do a quick ah, round okay. of introductions for everybody uh just so that everybody's familiar where they're sorry. from yeah no worries no worries okay so we'll sorry. definitely get back to the <laughs> challenges and needs in a bit uh but thanks so much for for setting the stage okay um thank and you perhaps perhaps we can uh you know loop in um adikoyo yejo Apologies for the pronunciation, uh, who brings a private sector perspective. Uh, a very brief introduction about yourself and the work you do, please. Okay, um, thank you very much. Um, it's really great to be here among this really rich panel. Um, my name is Adeko Ijeo I'm from Nigeria, electrical engineer. Um, I'm the project lead at Manamo's Electric Limited a renewable energy company based in Nigeria. Um, what we do basically is that um, we provide solar energy services for residential and commercial um, applications. Um, since the beginning of um, 2020, we started working on developing sustainable cooling solutions for, for smallholder farmers. We observed that there is a big energy gap that exists in the agriculture sector in Nigeria and Africa at large. So, we set up a, a SPV project, which we called Cold Box Store, to see if we could um, sort of um, create a nexus between the renewable energy sector and the agricultural sector. So uh, as we know that more than 60% of the working population in Sub-Saharan Africa are small the farmers. Majority of them stay in rural communities and on the south communities without access to energy, to power coal chains. So these are the problems we are addressing with our intervention um, called Boxster. So that is basically what we've been working on for the, for the past few years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much for, for that uh, introduction. And we will definitely come back to your experience as the private sector in terms of uh, your experience and the challenges that you faced. Um, perhaps I could, um, you know, uh, go back to uh, Professor Noza. Um, you know, you we've we've heard a lot about the Africa Center for Sustainable Cooling and Cold Chain. Uh, of course, its uh, hub is in is in Rwanda, and there is the idea of sort of building the ecosystem to expand it across Africa to support sustainable cold chains. Um, can you explain to us, you know, what opportunities would interested academics, investors, entrepreneurs, or governments for that matter, have uh, within the ACAS framework um, to, to support sustainable cold chains? Um, how can they participate in this process um, and, and support the scale up um, as you sort of go beyond Rwanda and cover additional countries? Okay, well, uh, thanks for getting back to me again. And, uh, you know, why we'll talk about partnership and how a variety of partners can participate and the opportunities that exist. Let me uh, quickly use this opportunity to express my uh, gratitude to our current partners in the development and launching of the African Center of Excellence for Sustainable Cooling and Cold Chain. Now, uh, in my opinion, the project, which obviously is going to be, or at least in terms of goals, going to be continent-wide, in terms of uh, development, you know, implementation and deployment of uh, cooling and cold chain technologies across Africa. The project would not have even taken off without these partners. And I like to just acknowledge some of them. The UN Environment Program through the United for Efficiency Program, I'm sure where most of us are familiar with that. Uh, obviously, the government of uh, Rwanda uh, through the uh, Rwanda Cooling Initiative, the so-called ARCU, it is. The government of the United Kingdom uh, through the UK Department of Energy, Food and Rural Affairs, DIFRA. Uh, the Africa Center of Excellence, again, based here at the University of Rwanda. Uh, Africa Center of Excellence for in Energy for Sustainable Development. And then the University of Birmingham, Toby, Toby's home institution have actually been you know, wonderful in helping us as well as uh, Harriet Watt University. So the question is, uh, what do I see as the biggest uh, upcoming opportunity or what are the uh, opportunities for po potential partners? What are they being academics, investors, you know, entrepreneurs, government, and all of them? For me, the uh, biggest opportunities abound everywhere. They are limitless uh, as initially defined 
we know what they are. We know what the numbers are. And it's been, you know, been there for a long time. The uh, our center of excellence is only really uh, developed to provide a viable platform for increase, uh, interested parties to come in and take advantage of the huge opportunities that exist. I mean, here's what I mean by, by this. We do have a huge food insecurity problem and the numbers were you know, mentioned by uh, Toby and Brian earlier. In the case of Rwanda, we're looking at between 15 and 40% you know, of losses, agricultural losses of produce you know, in the so-called first mile before they even get to the market. So the opportunities are huge. And I think in some cases, this same situation applies to the whole of Africa, or at least sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, so imagine the opportunities created in this situation for just say academics, let's take academics, who can get involved in finding solutions, sustainable you know, solutions in cooling and coaching to this problem. And imagine how much opportunities will be there. Or think of the magnitude of the potential benefits that uh, a typical investor or entrepreneur can derive from this if we're able to develop some you know, uh, sustainable solutions to these huge problems across the continent. I mean, the sky is the limit in terms of opportunity. Or even on the political realm, think of the mileage that politicians can derive from finding solutions to critical problems in their nations. Here in Rwanda, 70% uh, of the population are involved in farming and it's mostly smallholder farmers. So finding this kind of solutions is critical. In some cases, it's actually existential. So, I mean, if we look at all of this, you find that uh, the opportunities are, you know, boundless as far as what, you know, for partners, whether those partners be academic partners, whether they be investors, entrepreneurs, you know, industry, government, uh, there's just so much to do. And our interest here is to actually develop the technology and, you know, present it to the entire region and the continent, you know, for deployment, you know, ac across Africa. So I'll stop there for now. Let my other colleagues also comment. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor. Um, maybe I'll loop back to um, loop back to Adikoyejo. Um, um, you know, you're on the field in Nigeria, sort of deploying some of these solutions. Uh, you know, whether it's um, renewables-based cold storage solutions. Give us, um, you know. Professor Munoza mentioned that there is limitless opportunity here. I'd like to hear from your perspective in terms of, um, you know, how do you see, how, how ready is the technology itself to be deployed at scale? What are the challenges that you see for scaling up the adoption of these technologies, whether it's related to financing skills? What are really the big enablers from your perspective on the ground in terms of making this happen? Yeah, thank you very much. Well, I think it's a mix of these things you listed, um, access to clean energy finance and, and all that, especially with, um, I think one of the major challenges we, um, is getting access to green, green investments. Um, I'd like to mention that one of the major problems or one of the biggest challenges faced by smallholder farmers is um, post harvest handling like um, how do we store our perishable goods after harvest? How do we get access to markets? Uh, majority of these pharma, uh, farmers are undervalued because they're always in a rush to, to sell their produce before they go to waste. And most of them lose about um, about 50% of, of, of their, of their um, produce after harvest. And Majority of um, harvested produce in sub-Saharan Africa never reached the final consumer due, due to spoilage along the um, along the supply chain. So, without proper post-harvest handling and storage, um, shelf life of farm produce could be could be reduced to as little as two days or less. So, and so this is why we developed um, Code Box Store. Um, Code Box Store is a very efficient commercial cold storage solution that is completely powered by solar energy. Um, um, so what we do with Cobox is that we deploy these solutions in food aggregation centers. Um, these aggregation centers could, could be farm clusters, open markets, or, or food warehouses. 
Um, the good thing about cold boxes is that farmers don't have to own them. They only have to pay for cooling services provided. Um, and also the major goal um, for our initiative is not just providing sustainable cooling, but also to transform the, the traditional food value chain in Africa, which is mostly fragmented, really inefficient. So we want to transform that into a modern and efficient food value chain. Um, the major challenges we, um, that it, we are facing um, on ground at the moment is, is one access to, well, we all know that de developing commercial solar powered cold storage facilities are, is quite capital intensive. Um, so to get um, access to, to, to funding is quite um, difficult. So this is why what we are doing with our model is that we are leveraging on third party financing where they, they finance this project and we will then pay them over time as we are generating revenue from, from the, from the um, infrastructure. And one of the ways we are doing this to generate revenue is that we are providing cooling as a service for, to small other farmers. You pay according to what you store. Also, we also have a, another business model, which is a procurement as a service where we connect smaller the farmers to, to market, to off takers, then we get commissions from the sales mill. So these are ways we are trying to, one, we're trying to um, bridge the energy gap and also connect smaller the farmers to a, to a high value market. And also another major challenge, um, another major way we can scale up these this solutions is um, digitization. Um, digitization is going to play a lot of um, big role because the main essence of cold storage is to prevent post harvest losses. So, what if you can link these um, small other farmers to off as before they even harvest? So, immediately after harvest, they can have ready off takers for them to uh, that will off take their produce from them. So, they don't really have to work, um, worry about post harvest handling. So, so for us to really scale, if you want to scale this up, we have to focus on one, bridging that energy gap. And secondly, we have to focus on um, digitization. We have to find a way to digitize this, um, the, the agricultural sector as well. So these are some of the things we are doing at the moment with, um, with um, Cold Box Store. Great, um, thanks so much for that. And I think this also goes back to Toby's earlier point in terms of, I don't think Adiko Yoji, he, he considers himself as an energy company. He's probably an energy plus agri plus ecosystem builder because until each of those pieces come together, his business of you know an energy-based cold storage service cannot be viable. Uh, so thanks so much for setting that out. Uh, maybe I can loop in Gareth here at, at this point. Um, Gareth, um, you know, as we've heard, you know, financing investment continues to remain a, a key challenge. Um, and based on, you know, African Development Bank's own experience with projects, what are some of the investment challenges that you are seeing and opportunities to support cold chains, uh, both at the farmer level for end users enterprises, uh, but also, you know, broadly at the national level, you know, looking at larger cold storage infrastructure and the role of climate financing there. Because uh, a, a key point here is about mobilizing that money at the top and then making sure it's available through the right financial products through entrepreneurs, um, such as, um, you know, uh, Adiko Yoji in, in, in Nigeria, so that they can scale from 10 systems to 1,000 or 5,000 systems that are actually required. So we'd love to hear your thoughts on that, Gareth. Great. Well, thank you very much indeed. And I think some very interesting interventions. Um, you know, I think Toby highlighted the, you know, some of the technical uh, challenges around the, you know, the silos and, and, the, and stringing together the, uh, uh, the cold chains. And uh, like I also briefly mentioned that the challenge of financing uh, for small farmers and the fact that they can't borrow money and so on. So these are some of the, uh, the, the barriers that get in the way for investment into cold chain. And, and uh, so let, let me jump straight to a mechanism that we're working on developing because I know we don't have much time. Uh, we're, we have a, a mechanism called the Adaptation Benefits Mechanism and it sits under Article 6 of the Paris Agreement. 
which some of you may know is designed to mobilize private sector finance for either mitigation uh, and or adaptation and other needs. And there are market-based mechanisms there uh, and non-market approaches. Now, the, the market-based mechanisms are sort of typically the emission reduction uh, activities. And we know that it's very difficult to do these kinds of cold chain or cooling and energy efficiency things under the market-based approach. So uh, we've been developing the adaptation benefits mechanism to address um, a mechanism to provide finance, to plug the financial gap uh, in uh, private sector projects, to make them attractive to private sector to invest. So actually listening to um, Ari Cuello on, on the cold box store, it's very interesting um, that uh, you know, the, 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 the adaptation benefits mechanism could provide finance for scaling up uh, this kind of activity. And um, uh, we're still at a pilot phase with the ABM, and, and you can learn more if you if you look at ab, uh, abmechanism.org, that's our new website. Um, but uh, our first methodology, the very first methodology that has been submitted is actually for uh, the installation of solar-powered cold storage facilities for farmers in Kenya, uh, uh, because they're unable to store their seed potatoes uh, through the, the warmer season, they are rotting. Uh, and then they don't have seed potatoes when they come to replant. And um, so um, this is a, a very interesting approach to take uh, sort of a, a new look at adaptation as a way of financing the costs uh, of installing cold chain uh, solutions uh, for, for farmers. And I think that um, uh, the, the AB mechanism is actually something that's flexible enough to be applied at, at a top, at a high level uh, basis, at a programmatic approach, and also down uh, to a community level approach. So um, I think with a, a view on the time, I'll stop there, but I, I'd be happy to come back and give more detail uh, on how we see the adaptation benefit mechanism supporting investments into cold chain uh, and other technologies. But um, this is obviously a, one that's very key for, uh, for adaptation. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks so much, Gareth, for, for, for the introduction on the ABM facility. I think as far as investments is concerned, all hands on deck. So, you know, climate financing through adaptation, I think that's a great win-win uh, also linked to the uh, to, to sustainable cold chains. Um, I uh, would like to loop in uh, Leike now at this stage. Um, uh, we saw a glimpse of some of the, um, you know, the financing perspectives that you were you were speaking about. Would be great to hear about how you think, um, you know, financing products can be designed to support sustainable cold chains and some of the investment challenges that exist at the end user, farmer, as well as enterprise level that need to be tackled. Yeah, uh, thank you. Well, interesting uh, uh, to hear Garrett speaking about uh, this uh, adaptation benefits mechanism. Uh, because what we see in the field, as I told you before, it's it's, it's exactly smallholder finance. Uh, we within Rabobank have a Rabo Foundation uh, with which we do finance uh, smallholder farmer cooperatives um, uh, who can lend on the money to the smallholder farmers. So there are some solutions in that area. Uh, but what we also see when it comes to cold chain in rural areas is that there is a bit of a lack for proper viable business models. And this is something we would like to emphasize on because uh, private sector would never finance uh, uh, business models that are not sustainable or not viable. Uh, and it has several causes, I think. It's lack of maybe uh, professional companies in cold chain, uh, in, in, for example, East Africa, where we are active. Um, uh, it's also what we see, um, we need an integrated value chain approach. So we need to work together in the entire value chain. Uh, we need buyers, we need willingness for them to, to join forces. Uh, so this is something we see in the field as well. Uh, and the last thing, and, and I think m many people already uh, mentioned it, it's scalability. Uh, it's really hard for private sector to finance small amounts of anything. Uh, so just uh, financing one a uh, storage facility is not very viable for us. So we need scale in order to be able to finance the transition. Um, 
And as you saw on my slide uh, earlier, uh, what we mainly need, and that's why I'm very interested in Gareth's uh, uh, mechanism, is de-risking. Um, because uh, we still believe that, that the transition is needed and we want to finance rural, rural coal chains, for example, but uh, what we need is, is de-risking. Um, and what we also need is uh, digitization, and that's something uh, Adekoyeyo, <laughs> I'm not sure if I pronounce your name right, but uh, also mentioned with digitization, it's becoming more easy to finance uh, smaller uh, enterprises as well. We want to also leverage SMEs in that sense, so we are not looking at a pay-as-you-use service or a paper-use we are mainly looking at larger business models where we can use, for example, leasing or franchising or instead of, um, well, to leverage SMEs to exploit the, the cold chains um, uh, in this sense. So let me stop here and I would like to hear more about uh, the possibilities for de-risking and, and how uh, others see that. Maybe I'll uh, just to continue on that note. Uh, maybe bring back Gareth into this uh, into the discussion. Um, I think one of the one of the sort of things we're seeing here again is the scale issue. We can mobilize money at the top, but then the projects are extremely fragmented. So either some level of aggregation has to happen, or we need intermediaries who we can on lend through with adequate de-risking. Um, I'd love to hear about your thoughts in terms of how you could see something, money being mobilized through this adaptation fund, actually making its way down the chain to, uh, you know, let's say an end user or an enterprise um, in a rural area. Yeah, thank you very much indeed. So uh, we do have a very specific uh, sort of uh, approach or solution to that. Um, so the adaptation benefits mechanism draws on the project cycle of the clean development mechanism, which some of you may be aware of now. So to, uh, let me give you a couple of key statistics here. The clean development mechanism processed 12,500 individual projects, uh, some of which were called programs of activities, which then were you know, programmatic and went down to multiple uh, users downstream. The Green Climate Fund is about to produce, uh, about to approve, I don't know, FP 180, uh, and they've been going nearly 10 years. So the point here is, uh, you know, okay, the, the GCF targets a very different set of project developers, definitely not the small scale community based activities that we want to see working here, whereas the clean development mechanism had a project cycle and an approval process that was accessible. So we've learned from that and we've taken that approach to the, um, the adaptation benefits mechanism. It's simpler because we're not creating fungible units where the, the, the certified adaptation benefits that we create are packets of information for reporting under the Paris Agreement. They are not used for compliance. So uh, for that reason, and again, I won't get into too much detail, but for that reason, it's much, much simpler. And so we could foresee a situation where a community or a group of communities through a programmatic approach could come forward to seek finance from a purchaser, which could be a, um, a philanthropy, it could be a donor, it could be a private sector company in the developed world or, or those that can afford to do so. So they would seek a purchaser for the adaptation benefits and the, the funds transferred for the adaptation benefits would plug that financial gap. It would address the risks that Lika is, is talking about. It would give the project developers a minimum level of cash flow that would enable them at least to pay back uh, some of their loan or meet their financing costs until their cooling system is up and running and is a sustainable business with revenues coming from the farmers that are paying for the cooling services. So that's the kind of mechanism that we see. It's small scale, it's simple. There will be a lot of projects, but all it needs is a purchaser to say, yes, I'll sign a, a purchase agreement uh, and I'll pay you whatever price is negotiated for a certified adaptation benefit related to this project. And with that, uh, with that, with that purchase agreement, the, uh, the, the project developer can go to a local commercial bank, it could go to Rabobank, uh, it could come to the African Development Bank to borrow the funds it needs to build the project. Back to you. Great. Um, thanks so much. Um, and I think um, we've got about 10 minutes to go. And, and you know, we've heard a lot about the private sector. We heard a lot about the risks that the investment risks that the private sector faces and all of that. Um, I'd like to go back to Professor Noza here. And, you know, as we think about scaling up, you know, um, the, the Africa Center for Excellence for Sustainable Cooling and Cold Chains, 
to other countries. I wonder what role do you see for governments in this? Um, is particularly in, in rural areas, um, you know, the government through public financing must have a strong role to play because the private sector alone cannot, um, you know, build out this infrastructure uh, purely because they may not be a business case. Uh, and it is also a question of a development of agriculture sector and poverty eradication and incomes and all of that. So I'm very curious to hear your thoughts on what role for governments do you see in, in this process? Yeah, uh, thanks, Divya. Uh, again, the, uh, the approach we're taking from our uh, Center of Excellence for Sustainable Coaching is, you know, as, uh, as was mentioned a little bit earlier, a holistic approach, a system approach that actually recognizes all of the relevant factors that con can contribute positively to development of technologies and deployment of technologies. And this actually inc also includes governments, like you, you rightly pointed out. And for us, the, the role that we have been advocating for government and we've been pushing very hard right here in Rwanda is in getting the government to provide the proper enabling environment to private to the private sector to entrepreneurs to investors to actually get you know up adequate investments into these areas because like you rightly pointed out scale out scale up is a huge problem but Another big problem area is what kind of business environment is being provided by the various governments. And this is one area that we're working on and working with the uh, government of Rwanda and the East African community to help us and help you know, our other partners, uh, investors, our entrepreneurs to develop you know, uh, systems and programs that will make, make it extremely attractive for people to want to invest. I'll give you an example. We, in Rwanda, we now uh, do quite a bit of uh, vaccines distribution using unmanned area vehicles, the so-called drones. And the challenge that we see here, again, is schooling and, and coaching. How do you cool the systems you know, in such a way as to be able to deliver this from the, the source to where you want it to go? And how do you, you know, scale it up in such a way as entrepreneurs will have interest or, you know, financiers will be interested and say, okay, yes, I can finance something like this. And these are very ser serious problems. Sometimes you need government aid. You need government to come in to say, okay, we can help in, you know, so, so, so and so areas, either by way of, uh, you know, providing seed funding to, to get the proof of concept, you know, that can be presented to a financial, a bank like uh, Lake you talked about, and, you know, uh, and uh, other, you know, uh, environments or enabling environments that government can provide either through legislation or through just working with the uh, population to get them to understand some of the problems that are involved. These are some of the things we're, we're looking at. And this is where we see the role of government as being critical to get the technology to move forward, you know, throughout the continent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, Thank you for, you. thanks professor for, for highlighting the strong role for government in this, in this process. Uh, perhaps I can loop back to um, Adiko Yejo from, you know, sort of you've, you've, you've heard about, you know, the, the financing side of the story and you've heard about sort of the role of governments and the plan that exists in terms of scaling up you know sustainable coal chains across the continent um you know from for some from somebody on the ground dealing with you know deploying projects um you know if you had to go from x number of systems that you've deployed today to let's say a thousand systems uh in the next two years what are the three things that you will require to make that happen what is that wish list if you could grant it today? What are those three things that you that that can make it happen for you to go from X number of systems today to let's say a thousand systems two years from now? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, at the moment, um, we currently have um, two cold box stores that has been deployed in Nigeria. One is fully operational. Like we've commercialized one in Anuka, Nigeria. We just deployed another one recently. Um, also, we plan to deploy about three more solutions before um, the end of the year to um, third-party financing. Um, but 
Um, for us to scale, I think one of the key contributions to that would be um, clean, um, financing, like I mentioned earlier, uh, and also um, raising awareness. Also, we also have to, though we, um, one of the main advantages we have as a team is that we have a very strong technical um, technical team. We, have, we are very strong in that aspect. Um, earlier this year, we we deployed um, a a thermal shipper which was used to for an international airline to ship um, the Pfizer vaccine. Um, so with that kind of technical background, it's always very easy for us to optimize and uh, optimize our product, and also also very easy for us to shift it to just to optimize. So for us to scale, one is we need that um, we need financing. Um, secondly, we, we need awareness. Um, one of the major problems we face when we deployed our first solution is that um, majority of those um, smaller farmers were a little bit reluctant at first. They were not really used to what we are proposing, cooling as a service. They were like, what are, you, mm-hmm. what are you doing? But over time, when they saw the advantage, they started um, getting used to it. So we need to raise that awareness as well. Right. So the major thing that will make us really skill at the moment is one like I, like I said earlier is um, financing and the code box store on its own generates revenue. Um, we generate revenue from pulling as a service, from co- um, procurement as a service, and and code box store for itself can pay for itself within just one year. So with revenues generated from from that, we can replicate our solutions in other parts of the country or. Or in other parts mm-hmm. of Africa as well, and also like I mentioned earlier, is um, about digitization. That is one of the major things that will make us scale as well. We are currently building mm-hmm. a, a digital platform that will connect more of the farmers to our value market or the internal market as well. So mm-hmm. these are the things we are working on at the moment that will help us mm-hmm. scale uh, mm-hmm. uh, majorly. Yeah. Great. Thanks so much. And if I could just press you very briefly on the finance point, is it? Do you require sort of long-term debt? Do you need, is it a particular kind of financing that you think is missing right now, which needs to be provided or, or, or whatever existing financing you have is enough and that just mobilization has to happen more? Sorry? Do you need, last... uh, I, was just th- I was just wondering in terms of financing that you require, is it, do you need a longer term financing or do you just need more of the financing that you already have? Um, what we are with the business model we're looking at is more or less like third party financing, where a third party like or an investor we will uh, we finance projects, then we'll pay them um, according to a payment plan, maybe monthly, we'll pay them monthly so they can get back their money. So, what we're looking at at the moment is basically third party financing so we can deploy more cold box store across the country, right. across mm-hmm. Africa. Yeah, right. Okay, great, thanks. So uh, we have one question from the audience um, and we'll, um, it's about investments and financing again. Um, so uh, the question is that Professor Nosa, he, he speaks about how there is a little investment and green investment out there. Um, in earlier sessions as well, the same theme came across quite strongly. And the person who's asking the question is, is wondering why is that the case? Is it because it is not a priority for the private sector in the region at the moment? Or is it that the government doesn't create the incentive to do that? Uh, so I will open the floor. We've got about two minutes to go. So if anybody wants to briefly react to that, um, the floor is open. Uh, uh, Divian, yes. Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah, since... Uh, there's a reference to some of the things I uh, I mm-hmm. said. I think I want to quickly uh, mm-hmm. uh, chime in here. Mm-hmm. I, I think the the uh, problem is a combination of factors. It's not just mm-hmm. one sing- single factor like we discussed earlier on. Uh, number one, there's a problem of awareness uh, amongst both the uh, population in need of the services that is a smallholder farmers and even the community at large you know, to realize that this is a big problem. That's one. Secondly, there's a, a problem of, of uh, you know, how smallholder farmers and maybe even cooperatives are able to justify the need for financing 
from financial institutions. That in itself is a big problem. And then finally, the uh, government recognizing that this is a critically important service, and therefore there's need to put in you know emphasis into the, you know putting together legislation to support these activities and enhance the ability of you know uh, deployment of some of this technology in rural areas that yeah. usually don't have the kind of infrastructure that you know we're all familiar with. All of these you know factors contribute to the problem that we're talking about. And we're hoping that with this kind of, you know, uh, fora and discussions and enlightenment and, you know, uh, people will get to know exactly what is going on and hopefully the situation will improve with time. And our center, you know, one of the goals that we have is actually pushing out as much information as possible across the mm -hmm. centers, across the, the continent, so that people know that, yes, there's a big problem here and this problem needs to be addressed and it's important. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Professor. Yeah, I, I want to uh, react, if I may, uh, mm -hmm. because I, took, I fully agree uh, on what NOSA says. Um, I want to add one thing, which is uh, buyers. We yeah. definitely need buyers in this system who are willing to join forces with smallholder farmers, with the SME who is exploiting that cold chain uh, or that cold storage facility. This is essential, especially for private sector investments. It's essential to have a business case, to have a buyer uh, in this whole uh, system, ecosystem. If there is no champion, if there is no business champion in this, then uh, it's going to be really hard. And then, of course, you need an, an enabling environment for government. You need blended finance for the first few years for the, for, to, to make that transition. But in, in essence, you will be needing that buyer. And I can't emphasize it enough. We need viable business models. Thank you, Liki, for bringing that up. And I think it's interesting because uh, very often we see that even in Kenya, sometimes the incentive to invest in these kind of technologies lies further down the value chain. So for example, in the dairy value chain, it is actually the processors who have the incentive to work with the cooperatives and the dairy farmers they work with to invest in chillers and you know irrigation pumps and whatnot. So I fully agree with your point in terms of looking at those buyers, the off takers and how we work with them and bring them on board in deploying these, these solutions. Um, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, Gareth, Adi, Koyeji, any uh, final words uh, before we uh, pass on for the closing remarks? Uh, I thank you very much. I think just my final word, final word is, is for governments um, to identify cooling as an adaptation need in their long-term strategies, in their adaptation communications and their NDCs, and to set out clear targets uh, to say what they need to be done so that developed countries can provide support to achieve that. Thank you. Thanks, Gareth. Hedi Koyeji, any final words from your side? I suppose not. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, we've reached the end of the discussion uh, for your very insightful statements. I mean, this conversation could go on for a very, very long time and hopefully we can do that at a later stage, uh, hopefully in person at some point. Um, and now it is my uh, great privilege to um, hand over the floor to uh, Zituni Uldad, who's the Deputy Director of the Climate and Environment Division at the UNFAO. Um, I've had the privilege from Irina's side to work with him and his team over the past several months um, since we've signed an MOU with the FAO uh, to scale up renewable energy use in the agriculture sector. Um, and we've also recently uh, you know, uh, announced a joint energy compact between FAO and IRENA uh, to, to this effect. And I see a lot of points of synergies um, uh, between what we've discussed here today and that. So uh, without further ado, um, Zituni, over to you, please. Well, thank you very much, Div1. Um, we are very proud of that collaboration indeed. This is really a nice and new space that deserves a lot of attention and a lot of things that we can do together with you, Irina, and with UNEP, the Cool Coalition, Sustainable Energy for All, Rabobank, and others. Um, so that brings me nicely to, to some key points really to take away from 
this dialogue and 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 thank you and 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 well done everyone. It has been really nice and smooth. There's so many points that deserve just some attention to to stress them really going forward. And I think as you started by putting this in the context of the International Day of Awareness of Food Loss and Waste, and the fact that unfortunately today we have 811 million people who still go hungry every day, and the fact that COVID also adding up to up to 132 million people who would also suffer from food insecurity. And if we zoom in particularly on food loss and waste, where globally 14% of food is lost along the food chain and 17% is wasted at homes and restaurants. So it's really critical that we talk about technological solutions and the cold chain is, is very much at the heart of that because without cooling, not only we can't store food, but as you perfectly know, we can't store medicine either, particularly in the current climate. That's really another challenge. This brings me to to highlight um, one uh, key development, recent development, which is the Rome Declaration on the Contribution of the Montreal Protocol, (coughs) excuse me, to sustainable cold chain to reduce food loss which acknowledges the key role played by the cold chain in the implementation of the 2030 Agenda and SDGs, particularly SDGs related to ending hunger and poverty, food security, um, and also improving nutrition and sustainable agriculture. So just to sum up, some of the, the main key takeaways from the dialogue we've just had now is that cooling technological solutions just by themselves obviously is not enough to make an efficient and sustainable cold chain. Because ensuring sustainable food cold chain requires also an integrated system approach as was well explained by Professor Peters And this system approach that considers not just technical solutions, but also skills and capacity, business case, and market access and finance. And I think these were explained well during the dialogue in terms of their importance and and relevance. And the other thing is um, the importance of accountability, because the systems approach goes hand in hand with the accountability, excuse me. And what the accountability means in this sense is the fact that we're talking about the cold chain, the whole food chain means that everyone has to be involved in this, obviously, not just government as it was explained, but also farmers and consumers. Mm -hmm. And I think by doing that and addressing the system approach and accountability, we can make maximum impact in the use of um, cold chains. The other thing I think that, um, (coughs) excuse me, Brian from Sustainable Energy for All made, which is the fact that household refrigeration must be made a reality. And I totally agree with him. I think it's about time to make sure that the technology we're talking about benefits those far away and those in remote areas, so they're they're included in in this. And the last point I would say is that there are a number of points made about the investment challenge, uh, the installation of solar powered cold chain solutions that was mentioned, (coughs) excuse me, is one of them. And also the, the scalability issue which is key at attracting investment and the importance of de-risking that was also highlighted. Excuse me, I I think I have uh, something in my throat I swallowed earlier. 
And one um, final point I, I will mention is the importance of digitalization in making easier, making it easier to finance the solution, particularly amongst the SMEs. And I think these are some of the points that came up during the discussion that for me, they're really good takeaways to take this dialogue forward to deal with, with these key points highlighted in, in making uh, refrigeration and cold chain reality, as, as was, was said. There were some, some points made about the wish list, how we go from here, and I think financing. And also I like the point about awareness among stakeholder, uh, uh, smallholder farmers with regard to the benefits of cold chain, what it means to them. It's true that there is some, some awareness that is needed there. So I'll stop it here on this point that for me, there are takeaways read from this dialogue. And thanks again to everyone. And thank you to the um, United for Efficiency and Coal Coalition for organizing this very useful and rich dialogue. And thanks to everyone who joined us. And I'll hand over back to you, Divwa. Thank you. Thank you so much, Zatuni, for, for those excellent uh, takeaways from the discussion. Um, uh, on, my, on my account, thanks very much to the organizers as well for, for organizing and putting together this event and giving me the opportunity to participate. Um, and looking forward to keeping the conversation going. And thank you all very much for your time.